Now, what have you heard about alchemy? We've always heard that alchemy is akin to modern chemistry, and we know many of their tools are still used. But on the other hand, we can tell that most of the time, these supposed attempts at transmutation failed quite miserably. We have learned through the media that every major civilization practiced the kind of transmutation of elements type alchemy throughout the history of modern Earth. There may be something to this. Perhaps people were so ignorant that they would spend their nights trying to make lead into gold. But a free thinker should understand what making lead into gold truly means. Lead into gold. How does that relate to humanity? The many sources available to the common people regarding alchemy push the listener, reader, or watcher onto the path of believing that alchemy was just chemistry, in every way as banal as today. Perhaps they were attempting to come up with new elixirs for the good of the community, but this is doubtful, for alchemy as we know it comes from east to west, and medicine was wholly understood in the east. It was nature that provided us with the elixirs. One only needs to study the ancient practices to see that there would have been little need for new elixirs, nor was there a need for common metals to be transformed to gold by some occult practice. Knowing that the knowledge of medicine existed at the time when this type of chemistry was supposedly being performed by certain historical figures can bring us to a better understanding of what alchemy truly means to those people who hold some measure of power over the peasant. It was spiritual and mental alchemy that reigned, and it is spiritual and mental alchemy that continues to do so. It's something to think about. What does this making lead into gold truly mean for humans? Reading on in the doctrine, we find a portion entitled why the esoteric teaching is kept secret. It is difficult to convey to the average European or American the true reasons underlying the secrecy which invariably surrounds the esoteric teachings of all the great schools of occult thought. Such a person is inclined to think that the only reason, therefore, is the delight in mystery mongering, which he thinks he finds among all occult teachers but one who penetrates even a short distance on the path can perceive the true reasons. Such a person perceives the dangers of premature disclosure of important esoteric principles to the unprepared public mind. The following quotations from a well-known writer will perhaps give a hint to the solution of this question. The writer says that the Oriental method of cultivating knowledge has always differed diametrically from that pursued in the West during the growth of modern science. While Europe has investigated nature as publicly as possible, every step being discussed with utmost freedom, and every fresh fact acquired circulated at once for the benefit of all, Asiatic science has been studied secretly and its conquests jealously guarded. I need not attempt an either criticism or defense of its methods. The student will later on see that this falls naturally into its place in the whole scheme of the occult philosophy. The approaches to that philosophy have always been open in one sense to all. Vaguely throughout the world in various ways has been diffused the idea that some process of study which men here and there did actually follow might lead to the acquisition of a higher kind of knowledge than that taught to mankind at large in books or by public teachers. The East, as pointed out, has always been more than vaguely impressed with this belief. But even in the West, the whole block of symbolical literature relating to astrology, alchemy, and mysticism has fermented in European society, carrying to some receptive minds the convention that behind all this superficially meaningless nonsense great truths lay concealed. Eccentric study has sometimes revealed hidden passages leading to the grandest imaginable realms of enlightenment. Until now, in all such cases, in accordance with the laws of those schools, the newcomer no sooner forced his way into the region of mystery than he was bound over to the secrecy as to everything connected with his entrance and further progress there. 
in Asia, the pupil of occultism no sooner became a pupil than he ceased to be a witness on behalf of the reality of occult knowledge. I have been astonished to find how numerous such pupils are. It is impossible to imagine any human act more improbable than the unauthorized revelation by any such pupil to persons of the outer world that he is indeed a pupil. And so the great esoteric school of philosophy successfully guards its seclusion. It is desirable to disabuse the reader of one conception in regard to the objects of adeptship that he very likely has formed. The development of those spiritual faculties whose culture has to do with the highest objects of the occult life gives rise as it progresses to a great deal of incidental knowledge.